Welcome back to the Hidden History Happy Hour. It is episode 55. No apologies to Sammy Hagar because we can podcast at 55. Yeah. And we have an amazing guest today. Alex, you know we love our first on this show. We have yep. two firsts, if I'm not mistaken. One, an actual naval commander. Thank you for your service, our, our, our as yet unnamed guest. And a dual national. And what more perfect person to have on our dual nationality podcast, Alex? Well, that's right. Um, great to be with you, brother. Thank you. Uh, my friend Andy Story is with us, uh, who is a Brit, uh, but also lives in the U.S. and uh, former naval officer uh, in my country and teaches uh, in the U.S. at the Annapolis Naval Academy. Um, I know him through the Conservative Party. And uh, Andy, don't be embarrassed by that association. Also a Harvard Business School grad. Uh, you've worked for Barclays in the UK. You work for Meta on uh, the other side of the world. Um, we're very, very glad to have you with us. You've got an amazing story to tell us. But Andy, hello. Introduce yourself. Thanks for the very warm welcome. Good to see you, my uh, friend. Yeah, now, yeah Andy. Uh, if I'm, what did I miss? You didn't miss anything. Great, uh, great intro. Very generous as ever, my friend. And uh, as I say, I shall look forward to to catching up in London for uh, something more than a virtual beer in a few weeks. Amen. Now, um, we're going to tell a submarine story at my end, but I think it'd be great if you could set the scene for us and explain your naval background and your history of service uh, in the Royal Navy. But first, we have to set the booze scene. Ah. I will be happy to go first. Oh, you go what first. What are you having, Alex, bro? Right? No, no, no. What are you well, having? Well, having an actual British Navy veteran around to be able to settle our long-running bet on when the British Navy stopped issuing rum as a ration. Yes. I am having rum and I'm having fresh limes from the lime tree outside in the yard. Now, I was not able to get Pusser's Navy rum, I'm afraid. However, I did get the Kraken rum. Yes. And also, it happens to be the name of my favorite winter sports team, the Seattle Kraken. Anybody want to guess what my favorite non-winter sports team is? I do not. <laughs> I, I i can't see it what does it say afc oh, richmond ah the fictional well. what real hat fictional team oh that's from apologies ted, for the uh, that's ted, ted lasso ted, uh, lasso yeah okay yeah so i apologies, took the view proceed. and i appreciate it's uh later in the day at my end than it is for either of you but i took the view um having had enough so andy we drink uh, in the spirit, no pun intended, in the spirit of the people we're telling stories about. So if we're doing a pirate story, we, we drink rum and so forth. And we've done so many naval stories uh, and I've had so much rum, which Brian <laughs> loves, that I've took the view that sailors drink anything. Uh, and therefore, I'm drinking some mere lust red from South Africa on the basis that if a sailor got his hands on it, he'd like it. <laughs> that that is a very fair assumption. Um, I, I think I think sailors will go wherever the fun is, and um, you know we 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 stopped issuing the daily uh, uh, tot of rum back during the seventies. But it, there you go, oh, I win, 70s. I Come win, on. I win. Bravo, saying, Andy. Unprepared, wait, you're saying, you're Andy. Will you, you just the... will you promise that was unprepared? T totally saying, unprepared. Wait, you're <laughs> saying that your courageous men and women fought the Falklands War with no rum? Yes, well, that was the dividing line, and I was right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Andy, sailors, sailors and Marines in um, His Majesty's Royal Navy are are largely treated like adults, so um, they do have the privilege to uh, uh, to drink at sea. Uh, junior ratings, the junior enlisted folks um, uh, are allowed to have uh, usually up to three tins of beer, and then the petty officers and chiefs are allowed uh, liquor, spirits, wines, things like that. Um, everything in moderation. Um, but I think if you you know if you treat people like an adult and you set expectations broadly they live up to them um and of course there's pretty darn severe uh sanctions if if you turn up on watch and you're you're drunk or you're hung over especially at a, a safety critical uh, responsibility then the, the sanction the career consequences is pretty darn severe uh but the tradition of the um uh, the tot of rum i mean that still lasts to this day so if there's an occasion of state um, such as a royal birthday or a, or a jubilee um, uh, usually the sovereign uh, or um, maybe one of the senior leaders within the uh, the admiralty will, will issue the order to splice the main brace. Um, and that's where, as opposed to buying a, you know, a tin of beer or, or, or have some liquor on board, uh, uh, the Crown will actually pay for 
uh, for sailors to celebrate with a um, uh, usually a tot of rum. And in particular in the submarine service, uh, and it's still the case to this day, people aren't compelled to do it, but it, it's very much tradition. Whenever you go through a pretty darn arduous process of getting all of your technical uh, and operational qualifications to be allowed to wear um, the Submariner Dolphins. Uh, in, in the Royal Navy, both officers and, and the enlisted uh, uh, team, uh, all of our ratings are sailors, uh, both wear gold Dolphins because we have such high expectations of of, uh, of everybody, of the entire team. Um, but you get your Dolphins in a, um, uh, in a in a shot glass and a tot of rum, and it, it's more than, a, more than a shot of rum, shall we say. And the tradition is that everybody, whether you're an officer or um, you know, when I got mine, I was a lieutenant, um, but I was, you know, stood in a line beside uh, some junior officers and uh, and some junior sailors that some of which had been in the Navy, you know, about a year. I've been in about four or five years at that point. Um, and, you know, together it's it's God save them, God save the Queen. You you down your tot of rum, you catch your dolphins in your teeth on the way down, um, uh, trying to avoid any medical emergency should they go further. And um, that's it. That That's the, you know, the end, the culmination of the rite of passage of of qualifying to be a uh, be a submariner and, and you know very 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 proud moment you you can take the you know take the man or the woman out of a submarine but you you never really stop being a submariner Can't take the it's, rum out of the man and you, so uh, then you're saying there is rum on british naval ships oh yeah yeah for for for, for sure i think you know guys if there's ever the opportunity to enough to said facilitate a tour um i think you'd be quite quite impressed by just how how well stocked the um uh the, the bar would be in an officer's mess or or what not on board andy you're i just a want generous, to say che- i want to say cheers to your unimpeachable expertise on this issue you're you're a generous guest andy and uh, <laughs> glossing over the dispute that exists between brian and i which is about <laughs> when the uh cessation of the issuance of the tot of rum uh, took place as my point being de rigueur it ended ages ago but I will um, to a point that I think we can unite us all um, uh, on HMS Britannia now retired our king um, toasting um, the loyal servicemen who had looked after the royal yacht uh, for their careers uh, or for part of their careers uh, this week uh, I give away nothing about the timing we were recording. Uh, this week, uh, toasted everyone with a tot of Pusser's rum. So, Brian, uh, your instincts are right about um, what we would have. Indeed, it's what the king drinks, so it can't be wrong. Fair. By royal decree. Cheers. By royal so, decree. So, let's hear about your illustrious background, Andy. And then before we jump to the story, I want to ask you a current events question that you're very qualified to answer. Please. Uh, okay, thanks so much. Um, so as ever, you guys are very generous with your introduction. I, I originally from Belfast in Northern Ireland, uh, joined the Navy to really get out of my hometown and go see the world. Um, after five or six years, I realized that they were giving me so many fantastic opportunities, you know, everything from being able to navigate a nuclear submarine to the North Pole. I know we'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, but I was also given the opportunity to spend um, uh, two full patrols, two effectively two full annual uh, trips down to Antarctica, so the very top, the very bottom of the world. Um, uh, I led a lot of the navigation training uh, in the Royal Navy, and actually one of the legacy, one of the things I'm most proud of leaving behind was the uh, the introduction of digital navigation. So moving away from uh, piece of, pieces of paper, charts, maps um, that had been used for hundreds of years before um, to developing the, the modern technologies and procedures that are used by the Royal Navy as a world leader, but, but by many other uh, NATO navies uh, right around the world. Um, and then I had the opportunity after my my time in Antarctica to uh, go off to Annapolis. I'd previously been there before on exchange as a uh, as a young midshipman, but had the chance as the first non U.S. officer to lead an academic department there between 2012 and 2015, which was a, a real privilege. And then selected for Sea Command and and finished out my uh, my time in the Navy in 2017. Uh, and sort of fast forwarding through to today, uh, had the opportunity to come to HBS um, here in uh, in Boston. For business school simply couldn't turn that down uh and after that yeah. recruited by barclays in london and then a few years at meta and that's kind of brings me up to up to date for today does, does that answer your question it does well, it's a very modest ahead, cv I'll... it's a very modest cv um uh accordion that you've just done and i wonder if i can pull the accordion out a little uh bit any stories from your time commanding uh 
commanding uh, trainees that you could tell us crossing borders any stories you could tell us about having a few drinks uh, i don't mean to tempt you there's anything you can't tell I, I, but uh... I, I wouldn't want to retrospectively call, cause a, an international incident but i i do remember having a a bunch of midshipmen that took a government vehicle uh, across a very well-defined international border um uh, to to basically go on, on shall we say for at least a day or so uh drinking somewhere where the age limit was below the age of 21 um, and um, then called to say they took a, uh, a wrong turn um, and they had no money to get back and they had spent all of their um, all of their cash and all their means of payment um, on uh, on having a great time in Tijuana uh, when actually they needed to um, they needed to be uh, very much back at the naval base in San Diego. So that that was very that was an interesting experience as a as a as a British Royal Navy officer um, at leading a U.S. Navy team, um, getting my way across into Mexico, um, and then having a conversation with a U.S. immigration official. It was like, right, so let, let me let me be clear: you're a British guy in charge of all these Americans, some of which have uniforms, some of which don't. Most of them have lost their IDs, and you're trying to get like thirty people. Um, back across the border without appropriate credentials into California, and I was like, "Yep, that's exactly." <laughs> and I, and I'm the border. Sure, I'm, sure, <laughs> well, I'm sure Brian can tell you the reception that would get. You know, the, the always uh, welcoming systems and immigration official um, as you try and get back into the U.S. But it, um, you know, that was a that was an interesting experience. And it's fair to say the, the you know the young midshipmen who. Um, they're under a lot of stress. They're under a lot of pressure, of course, when they're, you know, with the Naval Academy. The Naval Academy is a very different institution than um, the, than any other, you know, university and arguably any other service academy here in the States. But I would much rather they made their mistakes as midshipmen as, as opposed to, you know, make their mistakes when they're lieutenants or captains off, off around the world. Uh, it yeah, didn't quite for, sure. Well, let me, for sure. Let me... Sure. Let me offer two comments and a question to that great story. See, we already got a great story and we haven't even started the story yet. And I'm not even going to comment on your name being story. Comment one, y you have just combined the plots of the first three Tom Cruise movies. And if anybody doesn't know what I'm talking about, look it up. One, mm -hmm. two, uh, our, I will confess that our immigration enforcement is spotty and sometimes unprofessional at best. Now I will say, we very frequently stop Alex at the border and put him through secondary. So I'm proud of that. That's true. But otherwise, yeah. we got some issues. The question, why not just take a boat around and pick him up at the shore? Uh, that, that, that's, that's easier said than done. You'd like to think yeah. that, you know, all, all these young fit athletic kids that all want to be Navy SEALs. I mean, it ain't that it, it ain't that long for an open water swim off Coronado. But, um, yeah, some of them were slightly worse for worse, shall we say. And, um uh, I do remember the drive back, um, you know, as you pass the massive Mexican flag that literally is like the size of a football uh, stadium. And of course, you know, all, all of the uh, road signs, you know, this is your last opportunity to remain in the United States. You know, you are now entering Mexico. It was like, fellas, what do you mean? How you did you miss that? How, how, how did you miss <laughs> <Yeah>. that? <laughs> um, but uh, hey, look, uh, as I say, I'd rather they made their mistakes when they're, you know, when, so, when they're on training. Andy, you Those had character. some... You had some um, remarkable time when you were in service um, underneath some pack ice. And we can't talk about all of it, but we can talk about a lot of it. And I would, um, I'm going to choose my words with care. I'm just basically going to hand over the mic to you. Would you tell us about your time aboard a submarine underneath pack ice and what happened? Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, it, it does. Um, uh... It does feel kind of strange in some ways talking about myself as you know re re recent history and the the team that I was part of. Um, but back in 2007, uh, I was the navigating officer uh, on board a, a Royal Navy submarine, HMS Tarlas. We were based in Plymouth in, in Devon in the West uh, country of the UK. Um, I'd been on board about a year. Um, uh, as a reasonably young lieutenant, I was in my mid-20s, so 20, maybe 26, 27 at the time. It's a lot of responsibility for, you know, for a young man, young woman to, to navigate a nuclear submarine. Um, you're, you're learning the job every single day. And then uh, maybe 18 months, two years later, just when you get truly proficient at it, even though the Navy trains you to a very high standard, but when you really get comfortable with being able to, to do all the things that the captain or the executive officer would ask of you, you, you move on to your next assignment. Um, so it's, uh, it, it's a challenging role for sure. Um, and it's a challenging role in, in normal operations. Um, you know, a submarine operates in a very high consequence environment. Um, there are many things to go wrong at any time, but of course, the Royal Navy prides itself in being, um, you know, incredible at the level of training and proficiency that it puts into its sailors and Marines and, and very rightly so. 
Um, so we had a, a mission to deploy uh, to the North Atlantic um, and go further than we had done, uh, certainly further than that submarine that team had ever done before, um, to prove that we could operate at the, at the highest latitudes, right the way up into the Arctic, underneath the ice, underneath the North Pole. Um, and that's the very contested part of the world. NATO submarines have been um, proving they have the capability to do that since the, uh, the former Soviets used to deploy ballistic missile submarines. They used to hide underneath the ice um, because, of course, it provided great protection from um, uh, satellite imagery and, and the era and the technology that, that was available at the time. You could quite happily sit underneath the ice. You could still listen to all your radio signals that would that would come from, you know, from Moscow or from Washington or London. Um, but of course, you couldn't be spotted by satellites. Um, so to this day, uh, NATO submarines still have to prove they can operate up there. And of course, it, if anything goes wrong in a submarine, if the operational situation permits it, one of the first things you try and do is, is surface the submarine. There are less things that can go wrong or kill you if you're on the surface, uh, as opposed to being under the water. It's very similar to an aircraft. If a if a fixed or rotary wing aircraft had a had a fire on board, it would it would try and land. The submarine does the reverse, almost exactly the same thing, but, right. but back to. Um, so we deployed up to the, the high north, um, and without going down too far of a rabbit hole to kind of sort of set the context, um, navigating a submarine um, has the main challenge that a surface ship doesn't in so much as um, you don't constantly have access to things like GPS. You know, GPS is a super easy way to work out where you are. And if there's not GPS, there's other, always other means of doing that. But of course, whenever you go under the ice, you don't necessarily have the means to see the satellite, see the constellation, and work out where you are. But, but as well, the charts, the, 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 the maps of the ocean that you use are not very well surveyed. So you have to make a lot of assumptions as to just how deep the water is. And of course, you have an echo sounder. You can put sound into the water. It'll tell you how deep you are at that moment. But you always have to be very careful that it doesn't get shallow too quickly. And then you can run aground or be trapped. Um, and on top of that, you have a whole range of challenges as the sensors you would use to work out where you are, how fast you're going, which direction you're pointed. Um, they perform very differently. They're not as accurate. They don't have the accuracy or the precision whenever they find themselves at the top of the world. It, it's a phenomenon called Earth rate. Um, so basically a whole range of challenges. Just describe it has that to do with magnets, what, what, right? What do you mean what, about Earth rate? What, what, it what it has mean? to do with magnetism, but it also, if you if you consider yourself, let's say, standing on the equator, um, uh, you're moving at a, at a set speed. Of course, uh, that, that set speed... Um, as you work your way towards the pole and the sphere that you're on gets smaller and smaller and smaller, effectively you're almost spinning at an at a almost infinite rate. Um, so the, the way in which your gyro compasses and inertial navigation systems on board react to that level of inaccuracy is um, it, it creates a bunch of challenges. And then on top of this, we were trying to do this using both legacy paper plotting techniques, but we were also trying to do this digitally for the first time. Um, so a range of a range of challenges to say the least. Now, we were in partnership with uh, another uh, U.S. submarine, uh, one of the Atlantic fleet based on the East Coast. Um, the plan is that we would deploy there for about a month or so. We would do a range of tactical exercises, um, simulated attacks, um, and, and other training drills on each other. Um, really worthwhile, high-intensity training um, that was just you know ambitious, but entirely achievable. And we, we had proven that we could do. Um, but of course, when you get to... Uh, under the ice, all of the environment you're operating in changes. It's just not the fact that you can't readily surface a submarine in an emergency. You, um, the, the whole acoustic environment fundamentally changes. Um, sounds go so much further. Um, if you were to make any sound on board a submarine, uh, it effectively would be reflected from the ice canopy. So instead of a submarine being um, almost entirely quiet, um, you could potentially be detected at really significant ranges. Uh, and of course, the whole purpose of a submarine is that you operate undetected. Regardless of what the mission is, you always try and operate undetected. So one of the bits of equipment that a submarine has on board that it uses every single day um, takes seawater and it makes breathable air from seawater. It's actually quite a simple process to let you do that, but that creates a lot of noise. It actually creates more noise than the turbines or the engines or the propeller that uh, or propulsor that would push the submarine through the water. It's a very, very noisy That's tool. That's the to loudest use. thing on a sub. It's one of the loudest things on a sub. I mean, if you start discharging weapons or you start doing uh, yeah, battles, sure. uh, in normal uh, procedure, that's the yeah, loudest thing on a sub. Sound, yeah. It's one of the loudest things on a submarine. So whenever you're operating under the ice canopy, that sign can be reflected for 
you know, potentially tens of miles. Uh, mm. So if you're trying to conduct tactical exercises or if you're worried potentially about an intruder submarine being there, maybe someone, shall we say, who wasn't invited to the party turns up and, and wants to see what you're up to, you want to take every possible measure to reduce the, the signature, the self-noise of the submarine. So you don't use the normal means that you otherwise would do if you're in the middle of an open ocean to make breathable air and water and things like that. Um, so submarines, and this is something that's been around for goodness me, 50 or 60 years, use a thing called a, a self-contained oxygen generator. It's very, very similar to the, the technology they would use on the International Space Station to a allow skull. them to, yeah, skull, that's right, uh, to allow them to maintain the atmosphere. And effectively, it's a chemical compound. You put a bit of kinetic action into the top of it, um, it creates a bit of heat and some other byproducts, but it, it creates oxygen. And for a submariner to operate a SCOG, that's anything from the, the most young uh, junior sailor on board right the way through to the captain, you know, the chef, the engineer, the navigator. Everybody is trained to use a SCOG. It, it's it's almost like, you know, flushing the, the head or the toilet on board. Um, so we were using SCOGs for a couple of weeks. We had very successfully completed the first phase of our exercise. Uh, I shared some personal photographs uh, that you're very welcome to use on the pod um, uh, of myself and my shipmates uh, in, in the days before the, the, the accident that we had. Um, but we had very successfully proven that we could operate. We could uh, successfully find holes in the ice, referred to as collinias, where the ice sheet will shift. You can find something that's big enough to uh, surface the submarine through. Um, and uh, effectively, uh, on uh, I believe it was the 20th of, of March 2007, a little after 8 p.m. or 2800 on board, um, we uh, had two of our young sailors that uh, went up to the, the four ends of the submarine uh, to, to operate a SCOG. Uh, it was about an hour or so after the watch change on board a, a submarine uh, usually operating six hour shifts. Uh, so from one o'clock in the morning until 7 a.m., seven until 1 p.m., and then so on and so forth. Um, so I had been off watch about an hour. I had, um, you know, had a spot of dinner. I had literally gone into my rack, uh, which was a five berth right adjacent to the officer's mess on board. Um, and there was a massive explosion, um, an explosion louder than I, I think I'd ever heard at that point. Um, of course, the submarine is always at a very, very high level of readiness to deal with any emergency um, mm. uh, or any tactical action. Um, mm. The submarine immediately was brought to uh, uh, what we call emergency stations, whereby whether or not you're on watch, whether you're at a specific watch station or whether, like me, um, you were in your in your bed in your rack at the time, you have a very assigned set of positions to to take so that you can deal with you know, close quarter combat with an enemy submarine, you can deal with an emergency such as running a grind or a fire on board. This is something that Navy invests an incredible amount of time to make sure that um, people understand the rule, they understand the delegations. You know, the captain can't tell everybody how to stay in the submarine, operate the nuclear reactor, you know, man the weapon systems, deal with damage control incidents on board. There, there really is a team of teams with a lot of delegations and a lot of time and effort invested into well, maybe- let me just let me just, sorry, Andy, let me ask you a question about this. So uh, just so just so our viewers can get a picture of it and our listeners, um, is the I'm gonna use an old fast term, the klaxon, is the sound that tells you what station to go to different if it's like a fire emergency versus if there's a Russian submarine next to you, or when you hear that, do you not know what's going on at all? Uh, it, it very much depends. If you're going to action stations, if you're going to a fight, then the phrase action stations will be used. Um, if you're needing to respond to an emergency, um, then they will just they will just make the pipe, make the announcement over the internal broadcast system. Um, the U.S. would refer to it as one MC. We call it the main broadcast back home. Um, they would literally just say emergency stations, um, and then effectively. Over the course of probably 60 to 90 seconds, everybody on board assumes the highest possible level of readiness. And the people who are at the scene of the incident, let's say there's a medical emergency, or as in this case, there was a large explosion that took place in a very sensitive part of the submarine at the very front end. Um, then in that situation, the people who are in that compartment will immediately try to fight the fire, stop the spread of smoke, render. But you uh, know, you know you're not so, being shot at. Right? You, 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 know, you know you're not being you know you're not it's being still shot. Bad. Yeah. yeah. And and because of the the, the fact that, you know, um, there's a large bang, um, uh, smoke starts to, um, you know, filter through the submarine, um, uh, because of the issues with regards to the environment and the atmosphere and, and it becoming untenable, that you simply can't breathe, um, the adrenaline is, is even more so because everybody has to put on a, a full covering face mask 
it's referred to as an emergency breathing system. Um, so the folks that are fighting the fire at the time, they will have you know oxygen canisters on their back, but everybody else, regardless of where they are in the submarine, is wearing a full face mask, and that face mask is literally plugged into um, a valve, of which there are quite possibly thousands around the submarine. Um, so if you're, as I was in the control room at the time, trying to move around um, from the different watch positions, whether it's a navigation console um, uh, through to fire control or ship control, which are three of the, the principal uh, watch keeping positions in the uh, in, a, in a modern submarine control room, um, sometimes you'll have you know long enough cable um, or, or pipe that's coming from your, your EBS giving that fresh supply of air. Uh, sometimes you don't. Um, and of course, you need to be very careful about unplugging from uh, one supply of air before you then, you know, uh, may may not have somewhere else that you can plug into. So, so things like that, it creates a whether or not you're claustrophobic, um, uh, it certainly creates uh, a lot of adrenaline. Um, there needs to be clarity of thought, especially if you're in a leadership position, whereby, um, you know, in my role as the navigator, I was trying to support um, another officer on board who was the watch leader. I was trying to work out where the submarine was, uh, where there was a potential hole in the ice or a polynia that we could surface because the atmosphere was out of specification. It was clear we had a major fire on board. Um, and it was it was absolutely clear to me that we needed to surface at the at the first possible opportunity. So going across those different stations, whether it was the the navigation console or the far side of the control room, you you don't want to um, you know you have to intentionally force yourself to to be really clear as to you know what is the accuracy of the information you have. You know if you're going through a certain checklist, where are you? Sometimes you don't have the opportunity to complete every single step, but you don't want to make the problem worse by making assumptions based on um, uh, sort of scanty information or, or flawed right, information. Right. Um, and I think you know in this situation we had the you know pull those thoughts together. We had a large explosion. We went to the highest level of readiness um, that the, the submarine was prepared to do. Um, uh, we were concern because as i say the atmosphere throughout the, the forward part of the submarine where i was uh, certainly wasn't breathable at the time we needed to find a hole um, but of course the concern was this explosion had happened at the front end of the submarine in what we refer to as the forward escape compartment um, but right below the forward escape compartment on board a trafalgar class submarine is the weapon storage compartment um, whereby you have torpedoes tomahawk missiles um, uh, other explosive ordnance that um, you know clearly does not react well with um, uh, carbonaceous fires or 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 you know high energy release uh, kinetic event things like that. Um, so uh, Andy, it, Andy, tell us what what had happened. So so basically, what had happened was the, these two young lads, um, uh, a guy called Anthony Huntrod and another young lad called uh, Tony McCann, um, had you know, went about their duty in the appropriate way. You know, they they had selected a scog from the uh, the, the stewage. Um, uh, to their knowledge, it was it was perfectly fit for purpose. It subsequently turned out in the inquiry that the um, the the, the squawk had been damaged long before it had ever been embarked on board HMS Tarlas. Um, they they put the squawk into the appropriate uh, housing, um, the the mount that it would ordinarily sit. Um, and as they lit the squawk off, as opposed to it producing the fresh oxygen supply, we we talked about a couple of moments back. Very very tragically, it exploded in a in a confined space. Um, and those two young lads were, you know, were killed effectively instantaneously. Um, but, 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 but we didn't know that at the time. It was just a massive explosion at the front of the submarine. Um, and then we had to have confidence that, um, you know, all of our shipmates that were on their way to fight the fire, the folks that were responsible for, you know, driving the submarine and operating the nuclear propulsion plant, everybody was doing their job. Um, and that that takes a lot of trust because when something like that happens, of course, the, the first thing you want to do is to get to the scene of the incident and you know make sure everybody else is doing their job right. But of course, in doing that, you would um, you wouldn't be doing your own job, and everybody has a part of the jigsaw puzzle that has to fit together perfectly. Right. The situation becomes becomes so much worse. Um, so in that situation, uh, over the course of uh, actually what was a couple of hours, as I recall, it felt like just a fleeting yeah, moment. Days, the probably, yeah. Um, yeah, it, 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 it's it, in retrospectively, it, it's sort of kind of difficult to work out, you know, what was the state of mind? How is my perception of time? Because there were a million and five things to do. But of course, you only have the, the actual time to do just a fraction of them. Um, but uh, it was a remarkable effort. You know, the, the ship's company fought like lions to, um, you know, to get in to, to, to fight and extinguish the fire. And of course, um, they just didn't think they were fighting for their own lives at the time. They they were trying to get into the compartment, trying to fight their way through 
um, some pretty uh, you know horrific uh, situations to to rescue their two shipmates and and as well as the the two young lads that were killed at the time. Um, there was also a, a third sailor in that compartment uh, who mercifully they were able to uh, you know save and uh, and rescue and uh, and get out, which um, you know was entirely down to the you know the heroism and the professionalism of the guys who were who were fighting the fire at the time. Um, but then of course the challenge completely shifted. It shifted to um, how do we how do we find or make a hole to, to get ourselves uh, onto the surface? Um, and we were able to do that. Um, and once we surfaced, uh, we were able to ventilate the submarine, effectively take all of the, the atmosphere internally that, that wasn't fit to breathe, um, uh, expel that into um, just you know fresh air, bring fresh air back into the submarine. Um, we were then able to uh, really assess the situation in terms of you know truly what had happened. Um, and I have to say, we got um, incredible support from uh, the Alaska Air National Guard. Uh, we weren't quite at the North Pole when this happened. We were maybe probably about 120, 150 miles north of uh, north of the uh, Alaskan coastline. Um, and the Alaska Air National Guard, uh, obviously the U.S. military had been alerted as to you know what had happened. And you know these guys came out in a superb demonstration of airmanship and landed a C-130 Hercules on the ice right beside the submarine, right which is you. right next to us, um, which was a pretty ballsy call. Um, but they were able to, you know, come and render assistance. And of course, by this point, the, the submarine was safe. You know, we had very tragically uh, lost two of our two of our shipmates, but we've been able to extinguish the fire. There was no risk that it was going to spread. Um, and we were able to make sure that you know further people weren't injured. Um, uh, but it was a it was a pretty sobering moment. Um, you know, as I sort of fast forward, maybe over the course of eighteen or probably even a full twenty four hours, the following day um, after the the casualties had been evacuated. Um, to be landed ashore in Alaska. Um, you know, we had been there about a day. We had made sure we understood what was happening with all the systems on board. Um, and of course, we had to dive the submarine. We had to go back through the Polynia to get ourselves out of the ice and back to, back home to Plymouth. Um, and as much as we had confidence that, you know, the ship systems were, were were operating and, you know, the hull was signed and people were able to do their jobs, it was a pretty darn sobering moment when the order was given to take the submarine to diving stations and to shut and clip the upper lid and to, you know, open the um, the main ballast tank vents to dive the submarine to go back into go the environment. Back. You know, we, we were confident we could do it safely, but we were also confident we could do it safely a day before and it ended up killing two of our shipmates. Um, so I think you know the, the the two the two real sort of key takeaways because Alex, I know you're always a, a fan of working out with yeah. the lesson history, lesson from recent history. In this case, the two sort of kind of key takeaways for me are that um, you know you have to, in if you're leading teams in high consequence environments like that, um, you really need to invest in the relationships you have with folks. Um, you know, pretty pretty significantly. Um, you have to make sure that you're ready in the good times um, to deal with the bad times. And the training that we had uh, in the Navy from the, the Flag Officer or Sea Training Organization or FOST, uh, you know, it's not a pleasant experience. Nobody in the Royal Navy looks forward to going through FOST training. It's a, you know, it's a pretty sobering experience. Um, you know, the, even, the, even the grades or the assessments they give you, if you do very well, you get told that you're satisfactory. If you're exceptional, it's referred to as very satisfactory. You know, nobody ever gets a good. Um, you could get 99% on a test and someone would say that's a very satisfactory performance. But, you know, it, it's, um, it's once in a blue moon, anyone gets a good because then you become complacent. Um, and the Royal Navy to this day are world leaders in, in maritime training. But I think, you know, investing in the, the level of training and preparedness so that in the good times, um, you you'd make all those you know you you make all of the um, uh, the preparation that you need to be able to give yourself the capacity to respond when when things go bad. That's um, that that's one of the key lessons for me. And I think the second one is that you know you have to have the professional maturity when stuff goes wrong um, to yeah. really sort of dig into well why did it go wrong? You know some things are within your gift of influence, some are not. But but you have to have that maturity, not a blame culture, but to understand. Why did it go wrong? How do we mitigate that risk in the future? And equally, if something's going well and going consistently well, you just don't rely on luck. You have to understand how can I emulate that success? You know, what, why are we doing it well? Um, uh, and those are the two things that um, have kind of stuck by me throughout not just the rest of my naval career, um, but but also in the you know the various roles that I've had ever since. So Andy, I I know that um, there was an inquiry after this happened, and. Um the self-contained oxygen units or scogs um the inquiry has decided about what happened with those scogs left on the side of a dock before they're put in your submarine so yeah. i want to put that to one side 
you kindly invite us to think about the lessons from history here. And I, I just want to ask you to flesh out. I see out what you did bit. there, Alex. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I just want to flesh out a little bit the um, the point you were making about um, when something happens, knowing, trusting, believing in the people alongside you to do what they're supposed to do. Yeah. It's it, it's of paramount importance because you you can't micromanage a a team that has so many you know such a broad um, scope of responsibilities. You know people are navigating, people are are operating high energy systems, people are fighting the fire, people are trying to tend to medical assistance, people are um, you know trying to operate radios and communication systems. You have your engineers. I mean, goodness me, um, you know, a submarine isn't just a team; it's a team of teams. Um, and I think those lessons could be. Right be applied not just in military context but you know in large corporations as well how many of you on the boat at the time uh right about 100 um some of the larger ballistic missile submarines probably about 130 including trainees um, but we had a crew of about 100 and then we had um uh, sea riders on board we had uh it, a royal navy terms of sea riders someone who's not a member of the crew will will come along for not not certainly not tourists uh, we had you know sure. various scientists and the like um that were appropriately cleared and you know screened but then, north. they're not that are operational crews uh, or, or, no, or sea riders sounds very cool so uh that's it that's no no, I, I no one's no one's handing them the wheel in the midst of a crisis no but no, also they, they do nobody's get... turning down the title sea rider it sounds pretty Fair. cool to me yeah yeah and they, um, they, they do get to sleep beside the torpedoes so i mean that, that that's a kind of cool thing <laughs> that, people, that, uh, that on the other hand i just want to just want to zero in on this a little bit because when the alarm goes off and you're in your bunk and you're woken up to to get out and to go and uh, do your job. The point for me here is that you don't even know what's happened. I mean, afterwards, you know, the front of your boat was basically on fire. It, it, the front of your boat had exploded, but you didn't know what had happened. You didn't know who was hurt, but you knew what your job was and you knew what the job of the people alongside you was. Yeah. And you got on with it. Yeah. Um, and that trust and confidence, um, not just in the ability for people to follow a, uh, a checklist and do step one, two, three, but to understand what the delegations were, where they needed to make escalations, the sharing of information. Um, because if you're fighting something like a fire, you can't just open a door or a hatch um, to, to get into a certain compartment. That that has a whole bunch of operational right. ramifications. Um, so really been able to show that information effectively in a set format. And we we have this <laughs> thing in some ways whereby, you know, an order is not an order until it's been properly repeated and effectively receded for. You know, so if the captain will say, you know, dive the submarine, the, the exo who stood beside him will repeat the order verbatim. Um, uh, and then when you're in increasing positions of seniority, uh, both in the submarine service and and the, it works this way in aviation, it works this way in, in the surface Navy as well, um, you, your senior leaders, your captain, your exo on board really have this thing where they'll set direction, um, they'll set a command aim, um, but then they will they will command by veto. Um, you will have people who are experts in, in all the different tasks that need to be done on board. And then the captain or the exo can modify, delay, or veto any order that's given by a more junior member of the team. But what that does is it creates a bunch of you know bandwidth, capacity, perspective. It allows the, the right. highest levels of leadership to take a step back without having to actually push the buttons themselves and be drawn into um, you know maybe a very low-level task um, that would distract them from the, from the bigger picture. So th this concept of being able to um, lead a team and make, you have confidence in the team, recognizing they won't get everything right, but you're operating within a very controlled risk environment. People will share information effectively. And then beyond that, um, they will uh, they will know when they've reached the limit of their expertise. They'll ask for permission to do things that would affect or, or have serious consequences for everybody else. That, that right. That's a very effective mode of leading people, um, not just in the maritime environment, but I, but I think across many different situations as well. I'm going to tell you the trouble I think we have here, which is that you're too modest to to flesh out what we're talking about. I, as I understand it, you are woken with an alarm, and as it turns out, the front of the boat is on fire. And before you really get an opportunity to understand what's going on, you're tipped into a command situation. And that's what I want our listeners to to think about that you're flung out of your bunk and you are in a command, people are looking to you for leadership, literally klaxons are going off around you. There's a, as it turns out, there's a fire at the front end of the sub underneath the pack eyes. 
and you have to command people before you yourself really know what's happening. That's the scenario I want people to think about. And then you have to trust because you, you've got to get up through the pack ice to get breathable air before you can um, do anything else. You have to get up through the pack ice and trust the people alongside you to do their jobs and know that they can because you've been alongside each other long enough. Because if you try and micromanage this stuff, it's all going to go to hell. That's the thing I'm interested in. Yeah, it's um, it, it, it's definitely a challenge. And if you think, you know, submarines are designed to move through the water, okay? They're static when they're in port, they're tied up alongside, they're, they're moored to a seawall. But ordinarily when a submarine is at sea, a submarine doesn't normally just stop. Um, uh, because right. if, if you have any issues with um, with ballast, um, uh, it's 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 you know it's it's a lot easier to control whatever the submarine goes out of trim. It's too heavy, maybe or uh, one part or the other. It's a lot easier to resolve or overcome um, those trim and ballast issues by just putting a lot of energy into the water, spinning the propulsor quicker, and going faster to to you know to get to where you need to be in terms of depth or or heading or direction you're you're facing. Um, whenever you're trying to surface through a hole in the ice, the submarine has to come to a complete stop in terms of forward motion, um, and then you have to vertically ascend. That, like that, 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 in my humble opinion, is as difficult as landing, um, you know, a single seat tactical jet on an aircraft in in heavy seas, um, because you're not talking about you know one aircraft with all the landing aids that you would have available. Sure. Um, not that to be overly competitive with the you know the aviation world, but. Um, taking a submarine that you know is best part of ten thousand tons in terms of displaced weight, you're looking at about hundred meters in length, um, and you're trying to get yourself into a situation whereby um, your the submarine is going to surface through the hole you've either found or made. That, that, and, that that's and you and you have a hundred souls to think about, not one or two, right? That, 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 that's right. And the level of information that, that is being passed around um, based on the speed at which you're ascending, based on the direction you're pointing. Um, you know, of course, when all of this was happening, um, you know, myself, my colleagues in the in the control room, I was the navigator, the watch leader who was who was you know running the situation, the command team at the time, that information back and forth between the two of us, we had to make sure that um, we understood exactly what was happening because the margin of error really isn't that much at all. You're talking maybe a couple dozen feet either way, and then you miss the hole, and that that's a massive a problem because the submarine could potentially be trapped underneath the ice. But of course, whilst I'm having these conversations with with my shipmate who is the watch leader, um, you know, I can't be distracting the captain of the XO who are still trying to split their mental effort between the surfacing procedure as well as supervising what's going on with regards to the damage control incident and the, and the medical assistance that's being provided and all of those other thoughts. So that, that, that's why this naval approach to this command by video is, is so important because it gives your, your highest levels of leadership the, the confidence to supervise at the appropriate level, um, but then really rely on those trusted relationships that other people who have been given jobs, such as let's get the submarine safely on the surface, they, 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 they have the ability, the expertise um, to to do that in a way that's not going to cause another hazard. Because if you think about the situation, um, as much as at the time it felt as if it was a very short experience, but also it felt as if it was hours. Um, right. the, the passage of time when you have that much adrenaline is is something that's, that's massively subjective. But you know, if we had a had a subsequent emergency after the first emergency, then the level of resilience um, is is not what it once was. Whenever you know the first event happened. So there, there really was almost no margin for error. We needed to safely get the submarine onto the roof, ventilate the boat, deal with our injured, and, and as a subsequently turned out, um, tragically killed shipmates. You know, we needed to have that that ruthless prioritized focus on what the task was at the time. Um, but we just needed to get on and do our jobs and trust the person stood beside you. And I think that's something that you know servicemen and women have been doing for for a very long period of time. The difference in the submarine world is, of course, that. Um, you're dealing with such levels of technical complexity and so many systems of systems that we've already talked about in the conversation thus far that it's a um, you know it's a it's a bit of a trial by fire experience. But as I say, I'm, if I was to reflect on on why we were successful, you know, yes, there was absolute professionalism, heroism, the appropriate levels of delegation, trust in you know um, our, ourselves, our ability to do our own job, and 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 trust in our shipmates, but. The, the fact that we were able to overcome that tragedy and and deal with it in such a professional way, um, the, the, the root cause of that was the training and effort that we had went through in the weeks and months before deployment to deal with that exact situation. Maybe not necessarily a skog exploding, but 
um, you know, a, uh, an event on board that would lead to a serious fire and they need to, to vertically surface through a very small hole. That was something that we had practiced off the coast of Scotland um, for, you know, for days and weeks and months before we had deployed. So we, we had confidence that we could deal with almost anything. Um, and it turned out, you know, in the in the subsequent report that as much as it was very, very damning with regards to the um, supply chain decisions that um, resulted in having a, a faulty SCOG on board a submarine that never should have been there in the first place, um, the, the the professionalism and the, the way by which the ship's company uh, and the command team on board behaved was, you know, not everything went perfectly right, but it was, it right. was a pretty darn good effort. And I, I think if the same situation was to happen again, um, uh, and you know, people people couldn't deal with it better than than how we dealt with it. You know, back sort of mid March two thousand seven. Um, but but that's something that um, you know myself and my shipmates um, always uh, you know take a moment to reflect um, you know on that particular day because it's things like that that you carry with you for you know for for, for the rest of your life as it were. And uh, I bet you do. Tragic and situation. You guys, but, and you guys but, carry that with you, and you'll have reunions, and you'll see each yeah. other, and you'll. You'll toast the departed and um, the lost souls under the sea. And one of the things I um, take from that, though, that I wanted to ask you about is you can reflect on that and say how well you guys performed. And it's incredible that the result, in my view, was as good as it was. But if um, and all that training paid off in the scenario you were in, if you and those people were in such a scenario a second time do you think you would have operated better or do you think people knowing what had happened before to them and what had happened around them would have operated worse um i think uh that, i mean that, that, that's a it's, a it's an it's a great question but it's a um it's a very it's a very difficult question because you know, I'm not a big believer in you know fate or butterfly effect or anything like that, but I think you know, the smallest technical or operational difference um, in terms of the decision matrices or, or various decision points that you have when you're dealing with an emergency, you know, if you're at a slightly deeper depth, you react in a different way. If the explosion had been on a different compartment on board the submarine, right. you react in a different way. If we had had a fire, let's say for example in the control room, you know, yes, you can evacuate the control room and you can manage things like rudder and propulsion control from various remote stations around the submarine. But there are more critical mission essential watch stations or positions or compartments uh, than others. And I think if we were to have, you know, if, obviously in simplest terms, if we were to have forewarning there was a faulty skull on board, then, you know, we, we, we wouldn't have been there. It was a training and tactical development exercise. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't wartime operations. Um, uh, so th there would have been no compelling necessity to blindly accept risk um, uh, but if we were to have a, you know, it, obviously I'm no longer in the naval service or privy to you know any of the the detail of um, of, of sort of training and the like, but I'm I'm pretty darn sure that the the damage control um, actions uh, and all that happened in 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 Tarlis that night have uh, contributed to you know update and improvement with training and procedures. Um, and I really can't sort of overstate that point. I mean, I don't mean to be a cheerleader for the Royal Navy, but the level of training they provide um, in surface ships, submarines, aviation, um, you know, with the Royal Marines as well, is, is just world class. You know, all of our NATO partners just don't come to Plymouth because they want to have a good run ashore uh, and enjoy um, all that the West Country has to offer. And, although it is a Andy, pretty special place. Andy, would you, would, you, would you call it, would you dare to call it Top Torpedo? <laughs> well, no, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't refer to it as that. That could probably be taken in a different way. But yeah, um, <laughs> uh, yeah it's um. Well, it, it, let me let me let me let me jump in with a couple of um, comments and questions. So, first of all, thank you so much for your decades of service to the West and your heroism mm -hmm. and that of your crewmates and uh, R.I.P. to your dead um, comrades. It's it's an amazing story, and it's a story that we don't get as often on the podcast because it has all that human detail of what was going through your minds at the time that is sometimes lost to history. Second comment is, uh, I don't know if any of you guys remember this. Alex is probably too young, but there was a 1982 film with Clint Eastwood called Firefox. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember that. Which, uh, yeah. Which was Come based on. on a novel by Craig Thomas and all of his yeah. novels were about U S British cooperation. Interestingly enough. And I remember it was the reverse scenario. Eastwood stole a, an aircraft from the Soviets and landed it on the ice pack and a submarine rescued him through the ice pack. And I remember thinking at the time, really like this, 
fighter is going to land on the ice pack and a submarine is just going to be there. But it sounds to me like you're saying the Alaska National Guard and Reserve did exactly that with you. Yeah, they did. And, and when we were um, when we were doing the, the earlier parts of the exercise, um, there was actually an ice camp. I mean, it, the whole ice canopy is constantly moving at a very, very slow rate, um, but, the, but the whole ice canopy uh, constantly moves. So these folks had um, flown out in smaller aircraft and they had, you know, pitched tents. They had put various uh, sensors through uh, uh, holes in the ice canopy so that we could work out where we were in, in terms of the war gaming and the tactical development exercises between ourselves and, and our U.S. Ah. counterparts who, who were there uh, at the same time. But So they were um, already there. Well, well there, there were scientists on the ice canopy, but whenever the, the incidents uh, took place, there was a, there was a military, um, I believe it was a C-130, uh, that, that was deployed by the Alaskan Air National Guard at I short notice as, as a quick right. reaction part to come and render assistance. And I, I was, you know, as I say, I was very impressed um, at the, you know, how quickly uh, they were able to, to get on the scene, but, but you know, landing an aircraft of that size uh, on the ice, uh, whether it's in the high Arctic or, or in Antarctica, where I've seen similar feats of impressive airmanship, it's, uh, it's not an easy thing to do. I, I credit the Alaska Air National Guard commander in chief, Governor Sarah Palin, but let's move on. Nah. The key question I want to ask you is we who have not been on the sharp end of the spear as you have hear this cliche all the time, but cliches are cliches for a reason that when the moment of life threatening combat happens, your quote unquote training kicks in. Mm -hmm. And this is what allows partly the Western militaries to succeed more over the Soviet military or the Russian military, let's say, because there's training is just better and more solid and more consistent. But what does that moment feel like? I mean, did, do you actually sort of go on to automatic pilot or when someone says the training kicks in, yeah, it means great question. this is how you think in, in a, in a crisis. So, so I think it's a different experience for, for everyone. Um, you know, if you're in a situation whereby you have like one job to do, um, then you know, that, that's, you know, maybe let's say you have a set procedure or a, you need to be in a certain place or you need to take some kind of action against an enemy, then, you know, if you're just worried about, maybe not just worried about yourself, but if you're like a, a young Marine or a young soldier um, or even a sailor and you're just doing a, a specific set job as a specialist, then, you know, that that's that, that reaction, that balance of, you know, adrenaline and fear of flight and then actually making your contribution to the team effort, that, that's one thing. But if you're in a situation whereby, you know, you're a senior rating or you're an officer, you, you maybe have a job to do yourself, but you're also managing what everybody else is doing. You're you're that second line of defense. You're making sure that, you know, the young sailor has pushed the right button, that has followed the right checklist. Um, you know, th that ability to have clarity of thought in the moment um, and overcome not just the fear for your own well-being, but um, all of the, um, you know, all of the desire to to do things maybe too quickly or to make assumptions. The certainly for me, um, that that's something that is 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 almost different every time. You never become complacent. You you know, you find yourself in these difficult situations, and um, you know some folks can become battle hardened. I suppose. Um, I don't think I don't think the people that, that live through those situations become complacent. I think you need to learn from them for sure. But of course, the you know, the challenge that um, that I had in my role is that I had a very specific, complex technical task to do. That was work out yeah. where the submarine, work out which direction we had to steer at what speed, um, and then you know find the bloody hole in the ice, uh, which is quite a small hole for quite a big submarine. Um, so so that was a a tricky thing to do. But of course. Um, you know, I had a team of, of folks around me and I was trying to make sure that, that they were doing their jobs as well. And beyond just holding them to a certain standards, th th there's a hearts and minds piece here. Um, you know, beyond yeah. the initial explosion, everybody sat there um, in these emergency breathing masks. You're not constantly, you know, pulling a trigger or pushing a button or, you know, using a firefighting nozzle. There are sometimes um, times of um, what to a bystander might seem like complete chaos, but, you know, the, the cadence will increase so that it's all quite frantic. Um, and then, you know, th that in many ways is easier to get through the challenges where you have to wait for five, 10, 15, 20 minutes you know what's the report yeah. that's coming from the scene of the incident has the fire been extinguished um you know is there a risk of the fire spreading to another sensitive compartment you know what is the state of our shipmates who were in that that compartment at the time so so i think your mind can play games with you and as we said earlier in the conversation your perception of time is is massively subjective so during those those moments where it's maybe not a lull in terms of the overall team effort but but you have 
the opportunity to take a step back and just see like, you know, what the hell's going on where you're stood at that time, that that's when you really need to make sure that in terms of like hearts and minds and morale um, is right. You know, the most junior right the way through the most senior members of the team, you know, they're looking out for me. So I need to look out, out for them. I need to make sure that, you know, they're in the right place because there, right. there may come a point whereby that young sailor who hasn't done anything for 10 minutes and is absolutely terrified how this is going to work out. Right. Well, there'll come a point whereby in a specific step of a process, he might be the most important person on that submarine, you know, putting the periscope up or open a certain valve or pushing a certain button or releasing another piece of equipment. So, so I think a... that, that, that's the kind of the way I, I think about it. Um, but of course, you know, that, that, that that's the way I reflect the way I, I thought about it at the time. The lived, experience it now. Had, yeah. the lived experience as, I had as, to, may have been very as different. The well, as, the, as the well-known philosopher Tom Petty said, the waiting is the hardest part. But let me ask you the flip question to the question I asked you a minute ago. Film and novels are filled with the opposite of what we're talking about. So what we're talking about here is a bunch of people heroically and 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 almost in some ways automatically following their training. But in films and in novels, you always have this one person, usually played by Tom Cruise, who will say, I'm throwing out the rule book. I have to get to the front of this summary now, right? So sometimes that decision's probably right, right? So how do you decide when you follow your 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 training versus you call an audible? Um, I think a lot of it comes with experience. And, and you know, if you're in a position, so that submarine situation that we, we spoke about was, you know, yes, the captain was clearly in charge throughout, but you know, there was a lot of peer leadership, um, you know, from some junior and, and even middle managers across the team, uh, depending on what the situation was at the time. But but I think as you become, um, you know, more experienced, you, you find yourself in a position of, you know, command at sea or, or even ashore, um, then you, you have a lot of power, you have a lot of influence um, in terms of your ability to, you know, command and control, or potentially, um, if you're in a situation whereby strict adherence to the procedures is not going to um, lead to the right outcome, then you know, that, that that's ultimately the weight of responsibility that, you know, people who get the opportunity to command, you know, sailors, Marines, ships, submarines, aircraft, um, mm. th there's a time and a place where the rule, but you maybe kind of push pause, but th that th that is very few and far between. And then of course there are absolute things with regards to, you know, ethical questions around rules of engagement and, right. uh, oh, you know, and, and sort of conduct in, in war fighting environments that, you know, you, you, you absolutely cannot pause. Um, uh, you know, there they, they are strict rules for an absolute reason. But, you know, if, if if the captain wanted to jump to, you know, step number 15 from, you know, number four, then then that's up to him or her to make that's the decision happens. to do that. But of course, you know, they, they're accountable if it if it goes wrong or it makes the situation worse. Um, and as much as the captain's ultimately responsible for what happens on board a ship or a submarine, of course, the responsibility is shared by every one of the souls on board. Um, so it's it's an immeasurable responsibility and a, and a real privilege for for those that have the opportunity to to lead in that way. So Andy, I'm, we're gonna um, I'm gonna tell a quick story, and I hope you're gonna um, give us your views on it. But before we do that, uh, it's been tremendous to listen to what you've been talking about. I think one thing that our listeners might be interested in is the closeness between the British Navy and the American Navy. And your life kind of encapsulates that. And I think that um, our listeners and viewers would be interested to know how you've come to be teaching at Annapolis now. And this might seem like a kind of anomaly that there's the Brit talk, talking and teaching at, uh, at the uh, height of the American Navy. So would you just give us a sense of how close these two naval forces are before we move on? Yeah, for sure. I mean, that, that's a, a a great point, Alex. The, the there is a very close bond between the U.S. Navy and the and the Royal Navy. Of, of course, at certain times of the year, um, shall we say, in early July, there's always a bit of healthy competition. Um, and, and dare I say, even a slight revisionist approach to certain historical things that may have happened, not just during the 1770s, right. but during right. the war. I know. I, I know. I know. I know. I know. I know. Alex takes that, that revisionist reference. approach all the time. <laughs> I got um, that reference. But, but, uh, but sorry, carry uh, on. Uh, there's a there's an incredibly close relationship um uh, and i think that you know that those relationships have been you know built and forged in the most extreme circumstances you know back through not just the first world war but into the the absolute heroism that we've seen you know in the battle of the atlantic in the second world war um, mm -hmm. you see the 
incredible success that the Royal Navy and the U.S. Navy had um, uh, in terms of deterring and um, uh, containing the you know the very real credible Soviet threat um, the whole way through the late '50s, certainly through to you know the high point of the the instability in the '80s. Um, the the, the relationship... to be again. Well, well, for sure, and and I think that if you look at the you know the partnership, the, the term the special relationship is is used every time you know uh, the PM comes to comes to DC or other cabinet ministers. Uh, the Americans don't use it that often when the British um, uh, press pack aren't there. But but I think if you were to ask any U.S. officer who has served alongside uh, a Royal Navy SEAL or or a Royal Marine Commando. Um, you know, they're really impressed and they recognize the value that Brits can add. You know, we, we don't have 300 ships anymore, um, but ship for ship and submarine for submarine, you know, a Type 45 destroyer in His Majesty's Navy is just as capable, arguably, if not more so, than a frontline Arleigh Burke destroyer. And, and I think that if you look back at the um, the inaugural deployment, uh, which was long after my time in service, of course, but, um, you know, just commenting on the on the public releasable de details of Queen Elizabeth's deployment to the Far East, you know, you had a Royal Navy aircraft carrier that was world class, and and many of the capabilities were greatly admired by the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Marine Corps. Um, you had a complete squadron of U.S. Marines on board, uh, with a U.S. Marine Colonel um, uh, with one of their F-35 fighter attack squadrons. Not just one plane, not just one off Strong Exchange right, flying a British right. jet. You had an entire detachment, an entire squadron. Um, of, of U.S. Marines fully embedded, operating the same types of aircraft, um, you know, sharing um, uh, procedures, sharing experiences, uh, developing that capability um, uh, in a way that uh, I think, you know, we have very close relationships with with other nations. Of course, we're still very close with Canada, Australia, you know, New Zealand. Their Royal Navies are operated almost exactly the same as as, as the Royal Navy is. But in terms of interoperability at the at the tip of the spear, um, the relationship between the U.S. Navy and the Royal Navy is remarkable. And I think that beyond the Queen Elizabeth example, the, the relationship between um, the, the respective submarine services uh, is is as close as it can be. Um, it's almost feels like you're in the same Navy sometimes. You were in the uh, same Navy. Uh, just a quick question about that. So I think there's a, also another transatlantic similarity. So you're, if I'm not mistaken, Andy, sitting there in Harvard University. That's right. And uh, Alex, of course, is a graduate of, what is it called again, Alex? Cambridge? School of Cambridge. Yeah. And so there's a transatlantic aphorism that works really well for both of you. And I'll use the U.S. version just to not overly insult Alex. And that is, you can always tell a Harvard man but you can't tell him much. Well, you, you do, of course, know that, uh, Brian, how, how, how do you find out, how, how do you know that somebody went to Harvard? First five minutes of the conversation. Uh, well, probably the, first you. Minutes, probably the first two minutes of the conversation, they'll tell you. Yeah. Um, but, but, but look, I mean, we'll not go down the Harvard rabbit hole, but I mean, it's well, such let a... Me, let, me, but let, me ask you more I've studied here. let me ask you a more serious question, which is, we talk a lot on this podcast about Ukraine. And in fact, I think if, if people go back and look at all of our episodes, which I encourage you to do all 54 of them, you'll see that we're very accurate in our prediction of what's going to happen. I'm not sure we've ever talked about the potential for naval competition in the Pacific, particularly with regard to the Chinese True. Navy. So how do you see that Andy with the combination of the U S and the British Navy versus the Chinese? Uh, that, that is a very interesting question. I think there are definitely lessons that can be learned from history with regards to um, how do deterrence and containment work against you know the might of the Soviet Navy. Um, the, the the West, I think, in reflection, always like massively overestimated the capability of um, Soviet surface naval forces, just as we have massively overestimated the their conventional capability in the ICBMs, land and bombs. Yeah. Um, I mean, they're strategic forces. They're, they're, they're nuclear missile forces. It's the largest arsenal in the world. Um, you know, that is a very dangerous, very credible threat. Um, but I think um, the, the the Soviet submarine force was a completely different Navy than their surface force, destroyers, cruisers, frigates, things like that. Um, you know, I've had the opportunity to, uh, uh, okay, some time ago now, but to see these vessels up close um, uh both you know many years ago and then more recently, uh, and their their capability against a, a modern NATO destroyer, um, it, it's just not like for like. Um, 
by 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 some way. So so I think if you then shift the conversation looking forward, you know, to what are the next three, five, ten years, um, what is what does the contest in the Pacific look like? There there are some things that can be learned from history with regards to how we deterred a very effective Soviet submarine force, but it would be massively complacent to think that we could use the same tactics or strategy to deter yeah. their the Chinese surface naval forces because the, the Chinese um have I mean, there, there, there's no tactical or technological advantage um, to the West in a way that there was even five or ten years ago. You know, the, the modern Chinese warships um, are are just as capable as anything within the, the NATO war band. Um, obviously, they have scale as well as capability. Um, they have the ability to deploy it and sustain it because it's close to their shore. Um, yeah, so I think plus land air power, land based air power, too. Yeah, of, of course. Um, but, but I think the, the situation in the Pacific, you know, there needs to be a very well, well thought through um, uh, political strategy of engagement, not just containment. It'd be wildly complacent to think that we could contain um, Chinese military ambition in, 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 in Africa or, or indeed in Asia Pacific um, in any environment. Um, that, that, that's, a, that's a difficult policy question, but I would hope that there's a strategy that lasts more than just one administration. That needs to be something that um, uh, that needs to be something that lasts you know a generation or more. Otherwise, you know the macro effects um, could be felt right around the world and that could end up being a, a very, very dangerous situation. I know some folks think that um, the, the Chinese in many ways are, are emboldened by what they've seen happen in Ukraine. Um, I actually think in many ways it, it, it really doesn't affect their strategic decision-making whatsoever. It's a right. very, very different situation if the Chinese were to be emboldened to make any, any move on Taiwan. And as much as we can, you know, we can have the, the gesture politics of, you know, Nancy Pelosi or other political leaders uh, from the West flying out, you know, to Taiwan, um, I'm not entirely sure that actually helps the Taiwanese cause. In many ways, it's saber rattling uh, or poking the bear in a way that, um, you know, may have unintended consequences. So I think there's a political solution to the Chinese question that can be in everybody's benefit. Um, I think we should definitely learn those lessons from the, the the Soviet parallel with regards to their submarine forces, but it would be absolutely foolish to think that we could play, you know, the 1960s, 1970s, um, you know, NATO playbook against the, the scale of the modern Japanese surface, Navy, or sorry, the modern Japanese Chinese Navy, because it really is quite an impressive naval force. I want to get to Alex's story, real, but but real quick, while we have you, and I'm thinking of you now as our James Cameron, I have to ask you as we sit here in July of 2023, what do you make of Ocean Gate? Um, I, I personally think tourists have no business in um, high consequence environments. Um, uh, like it's space. Absolutely, uh, it's, it's it's absolutely tragic um, what uh, what happened, of course. Um, but uh, you know, th there were a lot of things that um, the Ocean Gate team, in terms of engineering and innovation and design, um, you know, were clearly quite interesting. But you know, I, I don't have the facts of the case. I would love to to see what the, the technical detail was, of course. But putting dissimilar uh, materials, carbon fiber, titanium, um, you know, securing them in that way, um, and then going into that environment, uh, you know, there were some uh, there were some photographs that I seen of the insides of the uh, the pressure hole, uh, whereby they had you know computer monitors that were drilled into carbon fiber. Um, you know, that that is absolutely not something you should do. Uh, carbon fiber um, behaves uh, under great dynamic stress very differently than steel or titanium. Um, so, you know, really interesting um, uh, backstory, of course, the technology that they used to, to do that successfully 30, 40 times before the tragedy of, is interesting. But, you know, ultimately, fellas, I think that RMS Titanic is a, you know, it's a grave site. Um, yes. I, I think, tourists, in my humble opinion, as a private citizen, have no business being there. And then, you know, beyond that, the 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 um the significant effort that was right at the time to deploy coast guard and naval forces to try and um uh, rescue and find out what had happened you know that costs a lot and whenever we live in a resource constrained environment right across the public sector where you know there are frontline workers um whether it's in healthcare whether it's in law enforcement in fire that don't have the resources and the material needed to deal with you know traffic accidents or emergency room situations um here in the united states or similarly around the rest of the world um it's not a good use of funds to spend 15 20 million dollars or more to deploy naval forces at scale for this type of exotic tourism so you, you know i, I recognize yeah the but there, there's but there's but there's no universe where you don't try no, no, you, it was absolutely right to try, absolutely right to try. But, but I think in terms of the decision, I think it was announced today that Ocean Gate 
um, have ceased all commercial operations. Yeah, that is right. Them to do that. Um, and I think they have no damn business being there in the first place, not just because of the fact that it's a grave site. There is yeah. no societal or scientific benefit in visiting that location again, again, and again. It's just disrespectful. Yeah. But but why would you put people into such an extreme environment whereby you're not mitigating risk, you're blindly accepting it? Uh, and yeah. I think that, that, that that's the difference. You know, mitigating risk, fine. Blind acceptance of risk uh, and then expecting the casualty, the, the cavalry to come and save you, uh, you know, on any given Very day. That, that's just and most and most of the passengers probably had no ability to understand. Uh, I mean, they, I'm sure they signed a form. I'm sure their mm -hmm. lawyers made them sign a form, but they had no ability to understand the risk that they were facing. No, and, and I think you know you mentioned you mentioned you know space and aerospace and all that's going on there. You, you know, writing um, whatever you know, whether it's Virgin Galactic or whether it's um, you know what Jeff Bezos is up to going into space with Bill Shatner. Um, in many ways, there is a lot less operational risk in doing that than what there is going to the depths of the ocean that we see with Ocean Gate. A lot less risk. You know, huh. effectively, if, if the rocket motor is proven, um, you know, once you get through that ascent stage, you get through that period of maximum dynamic pressure, they refer to it in the movies as max Q. Um, you know, from that point, effectively, if you're a suborbital flight, um, you know, so the rocket's going to take you up to a certain altitude and then Sir Isaac Newton's going to do the rest. And as long as the mm. parachutes work, there's very little that can go wrong. Unless um, your math is wrong. Well, that's for sure. Uh, but you're going to come down somewhere. Um, if, you, if you're going to the depths of the ocean, um, and you know you're having concerns about your inability to jettison ballast or or you know control where the submarine is or even recognize that um you're approaching those um pressure limits whereby you're going to invite a catastrophic hull failure i mean that's just absolutely reckless and, and people have no business doing that so i don't mean to be too you know um non-emotional about it it's absolutely tragic what had happened and i i sincerely wish it had not but i would i i would very much hope that we don't see other commercial operations that pop up um, with a similar model and, and untested, unproven technology. Because, you know, I, as, as a submariner who has got himself into the shits under the water on many occasions mm. uh, and success, you know, in the submarine service, the, the a successful career is where the number of times you dive the submarine equals the number of times you surface. You know, and right. if that equation is right, right when you leave the Navy, then right. one's happy. Um, so I, I, without being too lighthearted about it, I would have loved to have seen a very, very different um, situation. But like there was no way that submarine was sat on the seafloor intact. You know, they lost all of their um, communications, their transponders at exactly the same moment. Um, you know, they had multiple immediate electrical failures across all of their their systems. The only thing that that happened was a you know was a catastrophic um, uh, failure of the pressure vessel. And yeah. you know, the only the only thing that um, makes the situation easier for the families who are left behind is the fact that 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 would have occurred with no notice um, most likely quicker than they would have had the cognitive ability yeah. to recognize that something was happening right. yeah all right alex a submarine story my friend well i feel first of all i'm humbled by andy's story and his service absolutely and second now i look at the clock so i'm going to take this quickly but um, for our, um, our loyal listeners and uh, uh, viewers, a story from uh, the books, and it'd be good to get Andy's uh, response to it. Um, I want to tell the story of U-156. It's the um, uh, U-boat uh, that set sail out of um, Germany and never saw home again. Um, Sorry, Alex, where can our viewers find this story? This is in Lessons from History, my friend. It's a the superb OG. book that I encourage everybody to, to read and buy. And volume one. Volume one. Uh, it put to say on Christmas Eve, 1941, uh, commanded by Werner uh, Hartenstein, Werner Hartenstein. And under his command, she sank 20 allied vessels, uh, circa 100,000 tons of shipping. And she harmed several uh, more. That is going some. Uh, but not record-breaking. Um, there's a clutch of others uh, that sunk uh, more. But she became extremely uh, well-known um, uh, for for several reasons that I'm going to explain. Um, she, uh, off the shore of Aruba, was um, lined up to sight against a uh, an oil refinery off, off the shore of Aruba and was uh, intending on uh, firing upon it. And she, the, the vessel, was distracted by the sight of a shore party making their way to church. How they could tell at the time that they were on their way to church is a, 
interesting question for the ages. But anyway, they could see some civilians on their on their way, and they held fire um, as a result. And um, her crew, therefore, as they were tracking these people going across, claimed that was the reason that they uh, had got this wrong. They didn't remove the cap on the deck gun after surfacing and, uh, before, before firing. And the gun, after they were firing, exploded. And that had fatal results for one of the crew and ill results results for a couple of others. Anyway, um, one by the way, the ill result for the other, given that U-156 didn't have a medical officer, was that he underwent a leg amputation at the hands of a well-meaning amateur, um, which doesn't sound like, like a massively... Yourself massively positive uh, outcome uh but uh as uh, the story will tell he went on to become the one survivor from this story so actually turns out to be okay for him um that explosion stymied their mission anyway um the royal mail ship laconia was the victim of u156 uh in september 1942 patrolling the oceans south of freetown in sierra leone in a cruel turn of events Hartenstein on the 156 inter intercepted a signal warning um, ships uh, abroad not to put into the harbour at Freetown because of the danger of U-boats. And that's how he came to find uh, the Laconia. And that's he saw a... Exactly. He saw a large ship um, armed with guns in the usual fashion and so the U-156 uh, fired on uh, the vessel with a torpedo. Uh, the Laconia, which was a converted uh, ocean uh, liner, was indeed reasonably armed um, and crewed by about 500 sailors. But she was a passenger ship. Uh, indeed, uh, some of the passengers were dancing in the lounge when the torpedoes from U-156 hit. Therefore, uh, Laconia was carrying... Um, this is going to sound vague, but um, sources disagree. Somewhere between 300 and 1,600 uh, British soldiers. I mean, these logs, the reason these logs disagree, people argue about who got on board, who, who, uh, and there's a reason that you can't work out who didn't get off afterwards. Uh, but, you know, who went on board and where they were coming from and which units were, were placed. But somewhere between 300 and 1,600 British soldiers were on board. Uh, there were some 1,800 Italian prisoners of war who'd been captured at El Alamein. There were over 100 Polish soldiers keeping guard over the Italians uh, and a clutch of civilians. On board the rapidly sinking ship, um, and she went down in under an hour, which is a terrifyingly fast rate of um, descent if you're sinking into icy cold seas. Um, there were terrible scenes. As the Italian prisoners were left to drown in their cells, and those who had broken out were bayoneted by their captors. It's a brutal um, scene to imagine. Lifeboats from the ship were put off. And let's imagine for a moment the perspective from the captain of U-156 looking up from his periscope. Um, he sees, to his astonishment, the plight suddenly, immediately, of thousands of survivors, including, if he could work this out, I don't know if he could or not, their wartime allies, the Italians, upon the rough seas, shark-infested, that he just popped up on. But their dilemma was immediately apparent to Hartenstein and his men. Point being, the interesting part of the story, flying the Red Cross, Red Cross emblem to show that um, she was embarked upon uh, the work of mercy, U-156 broadcast her location and surfaced to rescue survivors from the Laconia many of whom were then gathered upon her deck. She made then for Vichy France and for the, sorry, for Vichy French ships that were coming to help to put them aboard them. And she was not alone. Uh, Admiral Dernitz, who was the commander of uh, the German Navy, took seven other U-boats off their hostile duties with orders to help uh, Hartenstein's hostile, uh, hitherto hostile re rescue efforts. And soon enough, uh, U-156 was filled below decks with survivors. She had men crammed uh, uh, across her out of deck, and she had a clutch of filled lifeboats in tow, at least four lifeboats filled with people. Uh, and 
Hartenstein was transmitting on his own initiative um, her location openly, that it means not in code. Openly, trans this is against, Andy will tell us, against all traditions of uh, of being a submariner, radioing without, not in code, openly broadcasting, here I am, and in English, in efforts Something to ensure... would never do that. Indeed, in efforts to ensure that she wasn't thought a threat and that others could come to collect those that were in peril, including those on her deck. And Hartenstein's transmission, this is why I like this story so much, Hartenstein's transmission... Um, which I think is unique in submarine warfare, was this. If any submarine can come to the aid of the shipwreck crew of the Laconia, I shall not attack her, providing I am not attacked myself, neither by ship nor by plane. I have picked up 193 men. My position is 4 degrees 52 south, 11 degrees 26 west, a German submarine. Tragic results. Under the orders of their commanders, U-156 was then fired upon in sustained fashion by American aircraft who had picked up on that location. Even though the crews of those planes, no offence, Brian, knew that what her purpose was and knew of the presence of the survivors and had reported back to their commanders uh, the facts concerned. So to avoid being sunk herself, U-156 submerged in the face of that attack. The survivors upon her deck were cast back into the sea, and the lifeboats in tow were cut adrift in the troubled waters of her submerging. Over 1,500 souls were lost in the course of that incident. Some 200 bodies were found adrift uh, where U-156 had been forced to dive, and boatloads of survivors and corpses of those who had initially survived, washed up around the surrounding shores for over a month afterwards. The American pilots who were um, uh, responsible for what had happened and uh, were wrongly reported that they had sunk U-156 were awarded medals. Neither they nor their commanders were um, ever disciplined. They never faced any kind of formal uh, investigation over the incident. And of course, I would point out they had their defenders. U-156 promptly went on to sink another boat. And the Americans who targeted them might say, who knew you know, what other um, boats might have been sunk by the submarine uh, when it had been fin finished rescuing? Uh, that's the logic. I think my own view um, is obvious. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of postscript, I'm afraid, um, at Nuremberg, because the prosecutor at Nuremberg tried to use the Laconia order issued to U-boats, uh, which was not to rescue survivors, um, as evidence against Admiral Dernitz uh, as a war crime. And, of course, his reply was, well, yes, but that was because... Dot, dot, dot. Um, so I think it's a very sad story for all round. It's a sad story for Dernitz, who did the right thing. It's a sad story for U-156 and Hartenstein. And... Um, uh, her crew, who never who put to sh put to sea on um, Christmas Eve and never uh, saw their homeland again, uh, they were um, they were sunk uh, very shortly after the episode I've described um, by a flying boat, um, and it was an incredibly sad story for the survivors of Laconia, who, by dint of the um, actions of the crews around them in the air, uh, were not rescued by the U-boat. But uh, there we are. Well, I have a lot to say about this, but Andy, as a uh, actual naval officer, what are your thoughts? Well, it's a it's a tricky situation, right? I think if you're if you're dealing with you know these real critical decisions, you know, life or death in, in in any given moment, you need to you know you need to 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 deal with a situation that you see in front of you. Um, I think you know the particular time this happened in history, uh, specifically, you know, things weren't going all that well. Um, for you know, for for the Allied forces in the in the North Atlantic, um, the the total number of you know tons of shipping that were lost, the the loss of life that one U boat could um you know mm. could wreak havoc on an entire convoy, um you know some of the uh you know some of the the the, the novels, the stories, even modern day movies, things like Greyhound, um that movie with Tom Hanks is a is great film. A, yeah. Hold on, sorry, I have to interrupt you. 
American treasure, Tom Hanks. Uh, he, 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 <laughs> the only thing they got wrong was that the Brits were far better at anti-submarine warfare than the U.S. Yeah, Navy yeah, yeah. were. But you have to, you have to, uh, on this podcast, you got to refer to him as American treasure, Tom Hanks. American treasure, Tom Hanks. I, I will, I will absolutely give you that. Um, but, but I think in that situation, you, you know, it, it's, it, it's, it's very, very difficult to. You know, to generally work out with the operational pressure you would have, how would you make a decision in the moment? Somebody making a decision maybe from hundreds of miles away on an operational level that sure. their aircraft to attack and destroy um, a, a target, you know, seeing something from hundreds of miles away is a very, very different decision than actually, you know, being sad as the pilot or the bombardier um, and seeing the situation unfold uh, beneath you. I mean, that's one of the responsibilities of the mission command. You can often be given directions or orders, you know, from HQ from from back home, but but sometimes you you have to make a decision. Sometimes you have to to work out what is the what is the best or sometimes the least worst outcome that that you can influence because of the authority you have in the moment. Um, you know, tragic story for sure. Um, the the right thing, of course, for the you know for the U-boat commander to um, to recognize that uh, it wasn't a tactical situation. It was very much humanitarian um, and. It, it's difficult to make a decision as to what you would have done. Um, right. I, I don't think I don't think that any of those um, you know protagonists in the moment, whether the air crew, whether you know other surface assets that may have been nearby, probably had the full complete picture. Um, you know, I, I think in terms of a lot of the false flag exercises that the German Navy did very successfully during yeah. the Second War of um, you know, potentially uh, broaching a submarine, providing a counterattack opportunity. Um, the the Allied forces, the destroyers, would rush to that datum to try and prosecute the submarine to destruction, and then the whole wolf pack would be set up in a firing line to you know to to take shots at people. So it yeah. wasn't being ones, um, you know, the Nazis at the time to to play really silly, silly sinister tricks to try and lure Allied forces into um, effectively what would have been a trap. But but sure. in that situation, you're absolutely right. I mean. Um, very, very tragic outcome, not just for, you know, for the hostile submarine and, and the actions they took and what happened thereafter, but, you know, for the passengers and, and even the prisoners of war that that were shot at by their own side and, and such a, you know, such a needless loss of life. Well, well it I'll, seems look, to me I'll, that... I'll give you most, I'll give you, of course, the point about skepticism is completely, is, is very well made, but the judges at Nuremberg were hanging judges and the environment was a pretty hostile one and yeah. even in that environment the defense for Dernitz worked as far as the Laconia mm -hmm. issue was concerned but oh, I right. also want to um so there is there is that point in as far as this incident is and I'm, I've got an eye on the time because we've been going on a bit but Brian loves the story of the uh the guy in the village whose son breaks his back and you know we'll see it's from so the forth. movie Argo just look yeah, it from, up people. exactly so you know, you know the the is it good luck or bad luck? Uh, I will point out the sole survivor of U one five six was the guy who had his leg blown off when he failed to remove the cap from the gun at Aruba, right? which is exactly uh, what happens in the story it, in Argo. Exactly at the time, everyone would say, "What bad luck, right? What bad luck you got le your leg blown right. off?" Well, right. we'll see. And he was right. put off. He was put off uh, the boat at Martinique. And his colleagues would have thought him the unlucky one at the time. He was the only one to survive the war. Wow. Well, let me let me give a couple of thoughts to that, and then we we yeah, got to wrap up. Go and, and it's been just amazing to have you. And fantastic. We'll, we hopefully will have you again, particularly when all the secrets of uh, Area Fifty One are re resolved in a couple of years, because you're going to have something to say about that. I promise you. Um, Jeez. First of all, first of all. Um, I don't really think it would be reasonable to expect the American forces at the time to have spared an entire attack submarine, regardless of the, I mean, no matter what they knew. Even that, if they've got 200 civilians on the boat. I mean, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I, I'd have to do a, like a law of war analysis. Andy's probably better about that than me, but, but, you know, this reminds me a little bit of the amazing, uh, 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 Benedict Cumberbatch movie, um, the Imitation Game, where they mm -hmm. talk about, and I don't know how much of it's real and how much of it's fiction, but the idea that we withheld our secrets and allowed thousands of people to die on convoys to not give up the fact that we knew how to break the German We've broken the Enigma code. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I'm not taking a position one way or the other, but, you know, German U-boats were pretty prevalent and dangerous and deadly at the time. And I'm sure? not sure how much we should second guess those people. 
the better thing I want to talk about, Alex, is what you triggered me to do about a month ago. When you mentioned that on the man with high castle. Man in the high castle. Man in the high castle. Juliana took a life that, and you, you were very careful not to give away spoilers. Right. But she had taken many lives and she took a life of, a, of, a, of an innocent, but yep. in the cause of greater uh, you know, success. And I have now, <laughs> thank you very much, lost dozens of hours of sleep. And I'm almost done with season three of The Man in the High Castle. And I think I know what you're referring to. I'm not sure yeah. I do. But more importantly, I want to talk about the concept of transcend transcendent morality or not morality. Because that series, Andy, I don't know if you've have you watched that Man in High Castle? Uh, it, it it's a great series. Um I won't put any spoilers. The last episode is awful, but the the series itself is is fantastic. I, I don't like so this inclusion either. I'm with, I'm with you on that. Well, I'm not there yet, but I'll get back to you. So it's an alternative history. It's based on a Philip K. Dick novel. But the the thing it does extremely well is it takes real historical fic figures, and I'm now thinking of J. Edgar Hoover, and it puts them in alternative situations, and yet they behave exactly, exactly the, the same, same. asshole <laughs> way yeah. that yeah. they would have in real life. <laughs> and so my point is obviously this. Um if you can take out a German submarine in 1940, what was it, two, 43? It's tough to uh, not do that, isn't it? Probably 43. I, I, I don't know if that's I don't know if that's right or not, given what she was doing at the time. Um I I'm really this is one that that uh on which I'm truly um conflicted. Uh it was in 42, but um I'm really conflicted given the behavior of the ship at the time, but I see your point. Also, and I see we Andy's to not, too. Also, we have to not project modern ISR intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance capability on sure. the military at the yeah. time. Yeah. So, I mean, look, Laconia was, and not that it's helpful because your point would be that she might have gone on to sink lots of Allied ships for three years, but the Laconia was sunk in September 42 and. Uh, the the U boat was sunk in early forty three, but yeah. So what for your purposes for the moral test? She might have gone on sinking boats until nineteen ninety seven. It doesn't matter. I mean, it's it's an analog to the should we have assassinated Hitler if we had the chance conversation. I, I don't yeah, know the yeah. answer, but I I always I always think it's interesting to take it to the extreme for the test. Right? Let's imagine her radio was blown out and the crew of U one five six had no idea the war had finished. And she went on sinking Allied vessels until 2022, and then somehow managed to procreate and keep themselves alive and produce new vet, new crew members to keep on sinking Allied sinking ships around them. Uh, why not? Would it not have been right to sink it? Um, I still think the behaviour of the captain at the time, openly broadcasting their location, saying I'm bringing people to be rescued, come and take them off my hull. I think for my purpose, I, I really do think they sh that we shouldn't have fired upon it. And you think that the Allies should have taken that captain at his word? Yes. Okay. Andy, what do you think? I don't know. I mean, I, I see I see both both viewpoints. Um, I think, you know, if you're a, in a tactical command situation like that, you need to you need to make the best or the least worst decision that is, um, you know, is in front of you. But what what I would say is that I think the you know the the U-boat uh, and the Wolf Packs were more of a threat to the Allied war effort than even what the might of the Luftwaffe were against Southeast England and London, um, because the whole you know the the, the, the supply core, chain depended yeah. upon it. Yeah, uh, it, it absolutely did, and, and you know that that is something that you know sink the U-boat at all costs, and and the Germans to this day, I mean the the type of submarines they operate are very different from. The Royal Navy, U.S. Navy uh, nuclear fleet, but the Germans to this day um, are incredibly capable submariners in their diesel boats. Right. As as, you know, as of the Dutch, um, they, they 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 do a lot with a little, um, and you know, even in modern naval exercises, you know, the Germans, the Dutch, they 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 take their little submarines, they get in the middle of the you know the fleet maneuvers, and goodness me, can they cause havoc? Um, they're they're absolute <laughs> professionals. Um, Jets, but, yeah. I'm pretty sure it's going to be our longest ever episode. So I'm longest, but also we, we... worth it. 
certainly worth it. We're going to assist with my empty glass to say uh, cheers. We're going to wrap it up. Andy, thanks for being our guest. Cheers. Thank cheers. you, Andy. Thank you. Bye.